You're listening to Cards to the Moon, a podcast about trading cards from both a collector and investor perspective. We hope you'll stick around for the ride as we take a deep dive into the state of the hobby, share some hot takes, hopefully some useful advice and fun stories along the way. Hey guys, welcome back to Cards to the Moon. My name is Clark and you can find me on Instagram at 5cardguys as well as on 5cardguys.com. Co-hosting with me as usual is Hyung of Integrity Sports Cards and John who is back and he is trade you at recess on IG. Uh, before we get into it, just a quick shout out to Mailman Matt. We just saw your Apple podcast review and we're so glad that you think we are a must listen every episode. That's awesome. We appreciate the positive feedback and all the nice reviews we've been getting lately. So thank you very much. All right, off the top for episode 131, guys, I wanted to get your quick thoughts on a couple of baseball players and their impact on the hobby. All right. Uh, First, Wander Franco. As of this recording, he is batting 298 with six homers, seven stolen bases, and he's tied for second or he's third now, I think, in war with 1.8. I know it's early in the season, but he is in the top three. Plus, defensively, I'm not sure if you saw the clip where he picked up a routine grounder, flipped the ball to himself before throwing out Brian Reynolds at first. You know, this guy is playing with full confidence right now, um, obviously. So do you think there's a play here with Wander? John, you could you could attack this first. Yeah, yeah, I think it's better to get my since, opinion. Since, since it's your welcome back. It's, it's your <laughs> yeah. welcome back. It's better to get my opinion before the pro starts talking, so... No, no, no. I there's there's no input here for me, but <laughs> Oh man. It's a, it's good to be back first of all. Um it's been mm-hmm. a while. I have been getting some FOMO with all the good um good guests <laughs> that you guys have had on. Sad to have missed it. But anyways, Juan DeFranco, man, that that I saw the play. He's pretty cocky. Like I don't think anyone would even do that in like men's beer league. It's pretty pretty crazy, let alone like the majors. <laughs> um, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> On one sense, maybe it rubs people the wrong way, but at the same time, it it shows how comfortable and confident he is becoming in the majors. Like this is, you know, if it looks like it's a joke to them, maybe that's a good thing because that's what you kind of want to see out of players, right? So hmm. um, I think long-term, there's no question to me, Franco, I mean, the hype on him from what I know and from what Young's told me and from, from everything that you hear it's an absolute can't miss prospect. He seems like the type of player, um, maybe doesn't get into like home run derby type of conversation. He, he's got decent power, but maybe not a consistent enough to be somebody who jacks like 40, 50 bombs. But I could see him being like the next, maybe, maybe this is really high praise, but like the ne- next, like Suzuki, Ichiro kind of player, uh, a guy that's mm-hmm. tough to, to strike out, you know, puts the bat on the ball every time. Um, right. So I think long term, uh, if you can get into Franco at some point now, next year, um, I, I think his card still has a little bit to uh, simmer off a little bit more. But there is going to be a time where you can get into him and, and lock it up long term if you are the type to believe in him. Because the hobby right now is just like hype. I, I think it's become very high. If you're starting to notice trends and prices it's becoming very hyper focused. Mm. Like people, like investors and whoever's been in it are starting to kind of take their money out of base and silvers and, you know, starting to put it into numbered right. or like really, really rare cards. Uh, and on top of that, very select players within each segment of sport, True. right? And in sure. baseball, it's seemingly anybody who hits is a part of like the home run race is like what you mm. kind of go after, right? It, it's, Aaron Judge, it's Shohei Otani, it's Vladdy Guerrero. Um, and then, you know, there's the, the, the traditional Cunhas and Tatises. And then, you know, there's, um, after that, there's nothing else. Like, I don't, it doesn't look like everyone's kind of bailing on every other player. So I think Franco, uh, it's a little tricky because in the short run, he, because he's not a part of this sort of hyper focused, focusing on home runs, um, I would say, yeah, don't don't. Ex- I don't think 
for somebody picking up Franco, I don't think it's necessarily like a short term play, like a short term flip within mm-hmm. one year. There's going to be some crazy hype. I I don't really see that. But if you see Franco as a big time long term player, which I think you should have pretty good confidence. I I I feel pretty confident about Franco as a long term. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, pick and choose your spot in the next twelve to twenty four months. Mm. Twenty four months, I think it's going to be a great time to pick up a Franco. Okay, interesting. Yeah, you know, you know what I think. I think it's tough. Uh, Franco's a tough buy right now, just because timing and mm. there is a lot of hype around him right now, and he's he's balling out like expected. But you got, you guys got to remember, we we came into the hobby right when Franco kind of was blowing up in. In right. Bowman Chrome. So I think there's a lot of hype, right? But like John said, he's a flashy player. People like him. Um, the purist, again, they might disagree, <laughs> disagree with it. But I will say regarding that play, as baseball people, you know, you don't mess with the baseball gods. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like that's that's kind of messing with the baseball gods. And it will come and bite you in the rear end. It's just the way it happens. So... There is that element of, you know, I'm all for, you know, even pimping home runs now, like uh, bat flips, celebrations, emotions, right. like it's, it, it, it's exciting, right? And, you know, different cultures play the game differently, you know, um, and that's something that I, I, I've always respected about baseball. So I don't necessarily mind it, but I know a lot of the baseball purists, they're like, <laughs> absolutely right. not. This is disrespecting the game from a fundamental you know, perspective and, and stuff like that. But regardless, you know, to each their own in, in, in that regards, I don't mind it. Uh, but in terms of his card prices, I just think they're, they're a little overpriced, uh, to begin with. And I think part of that, you know, um, you know, we're still, it's almost like a bear, bear market rally, um, with wander cards. And I, I believe in his talent. Don't get me wrong. I've always believed in his talent. And then we discussed on this pod always. It's like, okay, he has an all star season this year. He's, you know, probably going to, you know, uh, be, you know, a candidate for MVP if he keeps on playing this way. Uh, but, you know, is he a 30 home run plus guy? Is he a guy that, you know, even if he does it, look at the comparables to guys like, uh, not saying Raphael Devers is exactly like Wanda Franco, but, you know, someone who's, you know, proven over and over again, you know, uh, you know, uh, just like Wander has, you know, in his earlier career, but, you know, guys like Devers have already done that and they get no love too, right? So mm-hmm. for me, it's, it's a, it's a big sideways game for Wander. However, I, I believe because, a lot of die down has happened. I think there are buying opportunities still on certain cards. And I, that's the thing. Like it's never a, is wander a buy or not, or is he worthy of, you know, being a buy? I don't think anybody, um, kind of like, uh, uh, disagrees that he's he's really talented. He's an all-star. He's a superstar type caliber player. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. I think there are strategic buys though around it. I think some cards are really overpriced in Wander, just like you know guys like Tatis and Acuna and Otani, right? Mm. Uh, there there are it's and it becomes a supply demand thing at that point, right? Because you know some cards are actually you know desired just more than you know another card and it's the same player, right? So. Um, right. Yeah, for me, Wander's a hard, hard one to to buy into right now. Um, especially, you know, you're starting to see uh, some rally in in a bear market. But I think there's a lot of, you know, um, yeah, I don't mind long term if it's a card and you're a fan fan of uh, Wander and you're, you know, looking long term and saying, you know what, I I believe in his talent long term and I want to lock up a card at a reasonable price in case he does you know, blow up or, you know, becomes an MVP one day. But, you know, until then, I think what we've noticed in baseball is the longevity of it. You guys, you see guys like Mookie Betts, you see guys even like Bo Bichette on Mm -hmm. a younger side of things, you know, they get no hobby love still. And they're, you know, dominating their game, um, you know, as much as possible. And, you know, uh, yeah, Wander might be the guy that, you know, gets the love like Acuna and J-Rod, but I just don't see the 30 plus home runs that really drive kind of like um, the hobby love for guys like Tatis and Sotos and Acunas. Right. So, but yeah. I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a believer in Wander. I think he's going to have a great career, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know about his prices too much. Yeah. Though. 
Yeah, no, that's a good point because it's one thing to like the player and this, you know, himself, and right. then it's another thing to like like it, his baseball good, cards yeah. for their value, right? So, um, I'm on the same page. I think there's limited upside just because his prices are still a little too high for my liking for what he's accomplished in his career, right? Yeah, so, right. Um, for the long term, he's got to keep this up consistently. And you know, baseball, anything happened from year to year. I like the power speed combo. That intrigues me, but at the same time, Ronald Acuna seems to be the better version of that, right? right? So I feel like as long as Acuna is playing the way he's playing, who's also mashing and doing really well, who's, Wander's kind of in his shadow. He did, sorry, just to mention, just earlier today, Acuna took a foul ball off in the... So hopefully aye, aye, aye. it's not bad news. Uh, he okay. went down pretty good. He had, he had to exit the game, so... But right, just so, throwing that on side because Acuna always gets hurt. Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, scratch what I just said. I'm all in on Wander. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's yeah. That's that's disappointing. Didn't hopefully he, get, he's okay. he got hit yeah, by a pitch he's pretty good. tough uh, a couple of games ago too. Just yeah, just yeah. It's, it's been yeah. He's a he's a magnet. Oh, he's a magnet. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, yeah. So Wander limited upside, but um, if it dips. For whatever reason, you know, there might be a... I I feel like there might be a short-term play. If it dips and he he's the one that has a full, complete season, puts a 30 home run season, 30, 40 stolen base, like even a 30, 30 season, I think there's short opportunity to to make a good flip. I have a question for you, Clark. You say short opportunity. Are you you talking uh, Bowman Chrome or flagship like Topps, Topps Chrome? I know, I know, I know your answer. Yeah, it's probably I, I, Bowman Chrome, right? I always talk Bowman Chrome, right? <laughs> or I always think okay. about Bowman Chrome when I make these um, comparisons. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, I, I'm just putting it out there because sometimes you see like Bowman Chromes are super overpriced, and then you know a Topps Chrome sure. might be super underpriced, right? So there might be buying opportunities there. But I know like you like to play in that Bowman Bowman game. I don't mind going back and forth because I I li- I personally like rookie cards, right? Mm-hmm. But I I, I am liking the longevity too as well with the bowman chrome game because you you know bowman chrome always is the first to kind of go up if it does yeah. right so right for sure and i i don't like i don't have i don't mind the tops chrome play when mm-hmm. the bowman chrome uh autograph rookie cards are just a real at a really high price right do you know what i mean right, so then right. tops chrome becomes more of a play for the hobby, like because there are so many more people that might be able to afford the Topps Chrome instead of the Bowman Chrome, right, right, right. Yeah. Like Shohei, for example, I invested in. We talked with Daryl. I bought yeah. the Topps Chrome because I, I I didn't want to spend thousands of dollars for the, the Bowman upcharge, Chrome right. mm-hmm. first auto, right? So, so um, but Wander's not. I don't think he's there yet. Bowman Chrome is expensive for what he's done in his career, but still, like last time I checked, I'm looking at card ladder. It's under thirteen hundred for a PSA ten base auto. Yeah, you know, considering so it's, it was three, four thousand. Yeah, it was a couple crazy. years ago. Yeah, you know, during the hype. So yeah, we'll see how Wander plays. Um, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned the baseball gods. When it comes to baseball, for me, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in baseball gods. <laughs> 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 and you know what? You know what the proof of that was when he did that flip, and then his next at bat five minutes later just hit a bomb. Right? Baseball, baseball's a long game, man. <laughs> baseball's true. a long, long game. <laughs> Just you wait and see. I might eat my words. It's yeah. true. <laughs> but for me, when I saw that, I'm like, I couldn't believe it. Like, imagine yeah. imagine it's, Reynolds was safe, how angry the coach would be. Like, he would never oh, do that yeah. again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know I, mean? I, I, I would lose my noodle. Like, literally. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's something that, like, you know, like, you cannot, you know, so you do that stuff and you don't. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, yeah. but I get it. It's like you're in, you're in the Roman circus, right? You're just. You're right. you're like twirling your sword yeah. before you execute, you know. So yeah. it's it's kind of like one of those things. For ho- if you're if you're hockey comparison, ahead, uh, if you guys remember that kid Linus Omark that was on uh, Edmonton, mm, yeah. so much, right. there was yeah, so much yeah. hype coming from when he was in Sweden, and then he comes to the Oilers, gets a penalty shot, and proceeds to do a spinorama before going into on the goalie, like <laughs> nonsense, like completely. Yeah, yeah. there's I no wash. reason we call to call it eyewash. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good comparison. Like, if you're a coach or if you're a player, you hate it. But if you're a fan, you love it. Yeah, you know what I mean? absolutely. So, 
All right, um, quickly, I didn't think we were going to talk that long about Wander Franco, but um, I also wanted to touch upon Fernando Tatis Jr. I think this is the first time we, we've been able to talk about him since he came back from suspension, just because we had all those interviews in the previous episode. So yeah, your thoughts on Fernando Tatis this early in um, his return? Mm. I could go, I guess, since I'm I'm a Fernando Tatis collector. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear, yeah, I want to hear what Young thinks. You know, for me, nothing changes, right? Like I'm, uh, like I'm excited that he's back. One, like it mm. just makes the Padres that much better. It's exciting for baseball, um, and you know what? He's uh, he's what I've noticed about Tatis. He's such a like volatile player. Like when he's hot, he's like yeah. unstoppable. But then he would go and he would absolutely look so bad sometimes. But it is the beginning of the season still. And he's, you know, he's holding his own. He, his numbers aren't, you know, out of whack. But I think there's a lot of pressure on him to perform. This is now the pressure's on because you're going to have the naysayers saying, you know what, if he doesn't produce the 42 home runs that, you know, he hit pre PD mm. suspension, mm-hmm, you know, right. then. It looks bad on him in general, right? People are going to, you know, use that um, as kind of like uh, against them, right? So I think he has a lot to lose. So I think, like I said, you know, like I'm a Tatis collector, so it doesn't matter. For me, I'm rooting for the guy because I believe in his talent. I I love collecting his rookie cards because when I came into the game, um, you know, he was one of the bigger chases too. Um, yeah. actually not as big, but, you know, I invested in him heavily and he's, he's done well with me. And I've sold some Tatis really early on in, you know, his, his early rookie career. Um, and I've done well, but at the same time, I've also let some big cards go that I kind of regret. Um, so yeah, I, I'm just a fan of him, you know, regardless, I, I, I appreciate his athleticism and the skill set he brings. It's rare that you see a type of player like, like him and you know uh, for me it's uh it's more of a long term anyways uh i know that he's going to perform right it's it's but i i do believe his prices are definitely inflated for um like what it is right now but if he does keep his kind of like talent the way he's been playing pre suspension i think his cards are still going to maintain strong value because he's that much impactful in in the baseball world okay yeah Hmm. i mean i i still believe and i've always thought that tatis is the new griffey of our generation the guy with the swag everybody likes Hmm. brings that excitement um the cool factor and he does obviously have a little bit of a stain uh on that reputation now but for those that did think like myself um, that were, were a big fan of Tatis that did think he was the new Griffey. I don't think for those people, um, their opinions would change at all. They were obviously like most people, I think were pretty disappointed, but they're still on Tatis's side. And then the, there's investors that invested in Tatis, maybe not necessarily liked him, just thought he's the big name. He's the big chase. And then supremely disappointed because of the news. And then they lose 80% of their value in their cars and they just bail and, say say f tatis that guy's a loser and then there are those as well right so i think um for me you know hitting 40 bombs returning to in terms of numbers and performance i see it i think it's he's going to be totally fine Uh, again i think we mentioned this before it's going to be an interesting case study for tatis because he's one of those where the pd suspension was like right at the beginning of his career so everybody you know for those that like Barry Bonds, that it was towards the end of their career. Now your entire yeah. your entire career is in question. Okay, the seventy bombs, the sixty two bombs, the fifty nine bombs. Like what was that? Was that PEDs? Like we don't know now. There's a huge question mark. But I think Tatis, um, he has a chance to rebound from all of that. Um, the only silver lining is long long term. You know, you. I think a lot of people can, and I, you can pretty much. You know, if, if Bonds doesn't is not going to make the Hall of Fame, then you could, you know, you could bet your ass mm. Tatis not making the Hall of Fame. So, long long term, it's definitely um, a, a bit of a sore on his career. But I, I think within the next, you know, if you're an investor or if you're a fan, I think anywhere from the next three to five years, it's you, you're gonna. I think you're still gonna enjoy the ride. I'm, 
I'm all for Tatis. And he's playing well. You know, like he hasn't seen yeah. major league fastballs and major league pitches in like two and a half years or whatever it's been. And I think he's playing pretty, pretty darn good. Yeah, he's all things considering mm. for sure. Um, I'm kind of the like in terms of long, long term, I'm almost the opposite. I, 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 I'm pretty confident that Barry Bonds will get into the hall. <laughs> you know, it might be a decade from now or later. I hope so. So, it, so if that's the case, then you know, then that's good news for Tatis uh, in a way. Right. Uh, but for me, I think, I think, I think is what Hyung mentioned. Like you just have to be patient with Tatis at this point. Like nothing changes. Mm. Although I have a Topps Chrome base auto and I have a Bowman Chrome base auto and I kind of, you know, want to hedge. So I'm trying to sell one of them, mm. <laughs> you know, because... Sell the Topps Chrome. Which is what I'm trying to do. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. He, keep um, the Bowman Chrome. I think that's <laughs> that's the card, yeah. Yeah, so I'll take a loss if I need to for the Topps Chrome and then reinvest into something else. But, um, but I like the Bowman Chrome still. But still, Tatis, um, it's interesting because when I got back into the hobby, I remember you guys were like, oh, Tatis, yeah. Like, I wasn't a Tatis guy. Like, I'm like, he's gets injured a lot. And then and then you guys, like, made me FOMO. So I bought, <laughs> I have a two, I have a Topps Chrome and Bowman Chrome Auto now. <laughs> and I'm like, why did I FOMO into this? Some, yeah, I have those days. I have those days where I'm like, <laughs> why do I ha- have these cards? <laughs> but, um, but no, I, you know, you're absolutely right, though, Young. He's very streaky. Like I had him on my fantasy team. You can't, you can't time it. You guys just, just got to ride him out through the whole mm. season. Yeah, because yeah. you never know when he's going to go on a ten-game hot tier. Yeah. And when and he goes never off, oh, yeah, yeah. it's just what, like unreal, unreal. And then when he's in the slump, he's zero for twenty-five. Yeah, you know what I mean, like, yeah. Is, we're we're kind of seeing it right now. Yeah, yeah. So you got to just—he's um, that kind of player, and and you just got to trust that that's. So just how he plays. Once he gets on a roll, that's where you like to capitalize. Mm-hmm. So, um, all right, we'll see. It's still early. You know, he's not even played a full month yet, I, I don't believe. So um, we hope that Tees does well this season. All right, let's move on to our regular weekly segment we call Hobby Headlines. So there's a controversial video going around on TikTok, and it's by former NFL player Evan Mathis who put up a video tutorial on how to trim vintage sports cards. Now, card alterations, of course, have a negative stigma in the hobby, which is what made this video so weird to me because the video wasn't really made to be controversial or to solicit hobby outrage. It just seemed to be a simple how-to video, right? (laughs) And um, so, yeah, the question is then, you know, for me, after watching it, did it suddenly become okay to trim vintage cards because now that this video is out there? Or do you think this video might encourage some collectors to trim their cards now that they know how to do it and potentially sell it altered without disclosing that info? First off, I'll say this. We mentioned this earlier on a pod. Like this, this has been going on for a while pre right. you know, COVID. This has been an issue, you know, and the big players in the game involved are, you know, guy auction houses like PWCC and, you know, Probstein and, you know, other, other places like that. So it, it's nothing new in the hobby world. I think I, me personally, when I seen that, I, my mind was blown, but what it has done is, is it has shed light, you mm-hmm. know, and I think that's the most important thing is, you know, people need to be informed about this because one, I think, if if you're trimming cards and selling it, I think right. like okay, we need to take a pause right here because I don't think anybody in their right mind can agree that that's right in any single way. And it's not even Evan Mathis. We're like there 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 are culprits in this hobby that are right. you know that have been doing this long, and this all existed even in the 80s and 90s. We just. We just we just are you know uh, more uh, prone to the information now because it's it's shed shed light. But you go mm-hmm. on blowout forums and you'll see you know there's a thread probably you know seventeen hundred you know posts long uh, talking about this ever since yeah ever since you know mm. who knows when and there's there's detectives out there. Oh, yeah. Literally detectives out there. They, right. and, and I'll, I'll even give a shout out to tiffanycards.com. They, they actually have a da- database of, you know, known trimmed cards. So 
Uh, this is something that I think every hobbyist or every collector investor needs to educate themselves on and understand there are, you know, some bad apples in, 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 in my opinion, in, in the hobby and there's malpractices that have been happening. Um, yeah. and you know, at one point even FBI was involved. Uh, but the, the status from what I've heard was it's now inactive, but like to me, I, I'm perplexed that you know it's like uh what's this is totally <laughs> illegal man this is like what is going on like how could he like post that right unless you know he's he's the he's leonardo dicaprio from catch me <laughs> catch me uh if you can kind of like working for to to expose that right but like yeah. for me it's just mind-blowing that you know we're we're seeing that like that tiktok video i watched the whole thing and i'm just wow this is incredible this can't this can't be good but in 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 the end it's good in the sense that people need to be aware of this and do their due diligence because there are some vintage cards that are in psa slabs and beckett slabs and even in the sgc slabs hmm. that have been altered so it's like yes it does matter because you might be buying one of those right True. and and one time I'll, I'll just end it at this you know i i once purchased a uh, tire woods um sports illustrated i think i mentioned this 1996 sports illustrated for kids it was mm -hmm. psa 9 and you know per the perforated edges on that card is like a big um you know a uh, big thing and this one kind of didn't have those perforated edges and i was uh talking to one of my hobby buddies about it and he was saying hey you know, that's a known trimmed card. It's it's an actual known trimmed card. So that's what stopped me from buying it because the question was, you know, th and this was pre-COVID, right? So the question was, right. if I do sell this one day, will that be an issue? Knowing that, you know, it is a trim card, would I buy it? And I actually didn't didn't buy it. And yeah. I'm glad I kind of didn't buy it because it, it becomes that, okay, do I want to sell this now? Now that I know that I have a, a altered card, right? right? So, right. Yeah. yeah. No. The blood is on your hands at that point. Mm. <laughs> um, didn't Evan yeah. Mathis, uh, who was a card pointer, Lameem James, that first sort of exposed this to the masses? Mm -hmm. um, I remember their um, description was like he outed himself. So apparently he already sort of had some kind of reputation that he's been doing this and people suspected some of his graded, oh, yeah. graded cards were like this. And then now he's showing the world how he does it which which seemed very very odd if that's true <laughs> right um right yeah i mean overall i am very against altering cards in that way like trimming uh it really shouldn't exist and if you happen to have a tough conditions card so be it that's that's fine a psa 6 or a 7 or an 8 especially in the vintage world um mm -hmm. but i mean if you did alter it some people might maybe some people don't like the rounded soft looking corners and i don't care if i take a loss in value i don't know who would ever want to think this uh, i want to chop it up to make it look cleaner and it's for my own sake or whatever i don't know but i think sure. the main thing a lot is, of pc people do it yeah i, I know i, I, I could, don't mind that. i don't mind yeah. that and and even if you were to alter it as long as you just i think the word is disclose you disclose it to psa or whoever you're grading it with right and it comes back altered kind of like extreme example is that mickey mantle that scc grader where somebody some kid or whatever you know like you cut around mantle's head <laughs> completely right. um because yeah. it's fine to say that it's authentic and it's completely altered that i think that's fine so you know I, it, it really it shouldn't exist but if it has to happen disclosing it is the big thing because other than that um yeah it's, sure. i mean it should be deemed illegal i don't know how you would technically police this right like you know let's say somebody sent in um a 52 mantle like raw altered that's mm -hmm. probably a 10k card on its own and yeah. who how are you going to police that like let's say psa is like oh this is fraud like they, they didn't disclose that it was altered um and what does psa not return it to them because now it can continue to go into circulation to somebody else do they that's the thing. There's so many out like, there already. Yeah, like how do you how do you do that? <laughs> what do, do you they, do? do they keep it, keep it, but then they gotta kind of pay them out. Like I don't know how you do that, right? So yeah, it's messy. Yeah, yeah. you know everything's 
um, just to be clear, everything's alleged with this Evan Mathis guy, you know, and um, right. uh, we don't know what he's been involved with, but just the by the fact that he's showing how to do it was a little bit odd. And I'm with you guys, you know, if it's for your PC, that's fine. Um, you know, you like the cleaner look by yeah. cutting off the edges. That's I don't have any problem with that. But I think the issue is the temptation or if you happen to want to sell it later, you know, um, the the price difference, like there, there's that temptation to like, oh, you know, maybe I'm not going to disclose it. To your point, John, disclosure is the key word here, right? And then, you know, you, you kind of sell it off as if, if it wasn't altered. Then that's obviously a problem, right? So, um, you know, with the with the cards now, with the grading, I would hope that, you know, the PSAs and the BGS and the SGCs would be able to, you know, better know if a card's been altered, you know, just by measuring the the card itself, right? Uh, I think they're hopefully have done a better job uh, trying to figure out which ones have been or have not been altered. And, um, but, but the flip side is like, I would never buy a raw vintage card, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. if it looks and, and, you know, it's the old rule, right. That applies here that if it looks too good to be true for the price, then it probably is like you yeah. know. It's like why but is this half the price? What what what, what 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 happens to those uh, slabs or the people that have the slabs that have been known to be trimmed? What happens, you know, uh, to those cards, right? And that's what I'm saying is like, what if your card? Let's just say you had a vintage card in your collection, mm-hmm. and then you look it up, and it's like in that database of known alter altered cards that is actually has a grade assigned by PSA or Beckett or SGC. Right. So I think another thing to mention is I don't think the grading companies are so innocent in, in at the end of the day too. I think they're the culprits as well. And that's important to mention because, you know, they're grading these cards, you know, known trimmed cards and you know, the, 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 the rabbit hole gets deep and deep and, you know, obviously do your own research and, yeah. and kind of see what, what's going on in that world. But yeah, that's I mean, the only question I have. No, that's a legitimate yeah. question. Realistically, um, you're probably screwed. You know yeah, what I mean? Right. Just the way the system is set up, you got to, I guess you're like, Oh, I guess this is for my PC now because <laughs> yeah. I can't sell it anywhere. Um, but up op- more optimistically, you would hope that. Because it's hard to trace, like who actually did the altering when you bought it, and you know you can't possibly trace how far back right, it goes. Right. So, like optimistically, you would hope that the grading companies would have a something in place where they would compensate the collector 100%. if they found out this, this is a known trimming. Yes. that's probably the one I prefer to see happen. Yes. Right, but you know. Does PSA back it as you see? Do they want to do that? Of course not, right? It's money out of their yeah. pocket. No, for but, sure. Yeah, but you know, to build uh, more confidence in their company, like I feel like if I was running the company, it's easier for me to say because it's not my money. But you know, if I if I own PSA or BGS or if I was the CEO, I'd be like, yeah, let's do this, and then maybe um, you know you get bonus points from collectors, right? And right, right. and that might be that might be a good business move in the end. Yeah. Just my opinion. Hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Optimistically, that is one hundred percent the way to get these trimmed cards that have been slabbed out of circulation. Is right. to, I mean, you know, legally, I'm sure there's no guarantees that PSA or Beckett or have ever displayed when you're when you're um, submitting cards. But that's their reputation on the line. They're supposed to be the professionals in this, and for them to exactly. grade. And say that it's authentic, and then also say on top of that that it's a PSA ten or a BGS nine or whatever it is. Um, yeah, they should be held accountable big time. But if they were to pay out everybody what it's worth market value, um, even if it was just like market value raw or a couple couple of grades lower or whatever, pay them out what they paid or what the market value is at the time of that PSA ten. Um, yeah, I think you would see most of these cards start to come in and get decommissioned but again yeah. like you said easier said than done because is psa and beckett gonna ready their million dollar wallets to start paying out these i don't know right like and we don't know how deep this goes and it, yeah, yeah true come on grading companies do the right thing oh, man, um, so. <laughs> well uh let's end off this segment with um, just a few examples of like the price difference between 
those graded authentic altered, which PSA does. And I'm, I think Backkit does as well, but I'm going to use PSA um, here as an example. And I chose PSA 8 just because a lot of these nicely authentic altered cards might pass for a PSA 8, all right? So this is what the difference is. And um, Scotty B cards actually had the 1954 Hank Aaron rookie card, right. pretty um, pretty iconic. His Hank, Hank Aaron authentic altered rookie card goes for about $1,400, 1400 A PSA 8 of that card last sold for like about 43000 Insane. That's the difference, right? Insanity. That's, That's what yeah. I'm saying. So the temptation, I'm telling you, right, to try to pass it off as a as a non alter card is there. Uh, the 1956 Mickey Mantle tops, not his rookie, but the one where you see a face and then in the background it's like an action shot. It's a very yeah. famous card. 1956 Mickey Mantle tops, an authentic altered card goes for five hundred seventy dollars, and a PSA eight version goes for fifteen thousand. Wow. Right? And uh, one more for you for the Canadian fans out there. 1979 Wayne Gretzky Opeachy rookie card. Authentic altered. Well, I'll go with the PSA 8 goes for 12250 And the authentic altered last sold for $200. Holy you, cow. That's crazy. You know, what, you know what's crazy? You know what's even crazier of that last <laughs> card? And I'll tell you of all the cards. You don't yeah. even know if that PSA 8 is altered or, or not. So it's mm. like that could be both <laughs> altered cards and that that that's the difference. And yeah. that's insanity to me because more likely than true, especially in the 80s and 90s, this mm. ha- this it's not – card trimming is not new. This has been okay. in the hobby. It's just coming to light, right? So that's why it's insanity. You know what's it's funny? It's literally is, insanity. Um, I heard this before and I, I think uh, podcasts like Jeremy Lee's um, – Sports card live, like I think they would be able to verify because I don't know the history behind it. Um, but I have, uh, I had boxes of uh, 1982 Opeachy way back in the day. My dad got me like a whole bunch of boxes, and that's why I have a couple of Wayne Gretzky's. Um, those cards apparently, because I look at when I open those boxes, I don't know if you guys remember, but back in the day, Opeachy, especially like '84 and pre before that. The OPG cutters were brutal. It was like, it's like, oh, cu- yeah. it's like cutting sheets of cards with a butter knife. Like everything came out ridiculous, <laughs> basically like shredded apart. And I think I opened five boxes and probably every single one of them, you know, my, my Wayne Gretzky's that I've submitted were straight from packs, like from pack to sleeve right. into to top loader when I was 12 years old. Kept it for 30 years. I submitted to PSA and they got like a PSA 4, 3, 5, 2. <laughs> oh, These are straight out of packs, right? Like no damage. And then I see PSA 10s and they have perfect edges, no fluff. <laughs> and it's like, there's no way because I open up five boxes and none of them are like that, right? And and then I heard that most of the 82 and, and maybe 81 and a bunch of those PSA, I mean, OPG years, the PSA 10s actually come from sheets that people manually cut. So they get the full sheet huh. and they manually cut right. them into perfect squares, right? Which now it's like, uh, wow. I don't know. Like, does that mean those are real PSA 10s? Because like, they're, right. not, they're not from the, I think most of them are not from the actual OPG cutters. The packs. They're from people buying the entire sheets and manually cutting them, right? And that's why they have wow. perfect corners and perfect edges. And Because I'm, I'm sitting there thinking like a PSA 10 Wayne Gretzky 82 and I'm like, how the heck does that have... <laughs> like mint condition edges and corners. Like I didn't see not one card that I pulled out of a pack that looked like that, right? That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know about that. I'm sure one of the Crazy. old dog, you know, old head uh, hockey guys can hopefully verify what I'm talking about. But that's something that I heard. Hmm. We'll try to get Jeremy Lee on the show. He might uh, know the answer yeah, to that. Yeah. But going back to the, wow. uh, the differences you know, it, between... Um, sorry, go ahead. Finish... Go no, ahead. I was just saying, Sports Card Radio would be a good, uh, good guy because he's he he's been on this since before. You know, everybody talked about it, and he's been trying to you know voice his opinion about this, and you know, rightfully okay. show he's getting he's getting the limelight now. So mm-hmm. go check out his stuff. He 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 talks uh, you know in depth about all this, and he's been doing it since you know 2019. You know, back back in the day, four or five years ago. So mm-hmm. yeah. The hobby super sleuths. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you guys watch um, a YouTube channel. Uh, it's 
fairly new, but I think I showed it to you guys when the first the first episode came out. It was really like looked really well produced. It's called Chasing mm-hmm. Cardboard. Um, okay. and, and good timing. Good timing. His latest video is is called We Destroyed a Fifty Two Mickey Mantle, which is a bit of clickbait, but um, I don't want to spoil it alert for anybody. But basically, he um, gets a collection from an old buyer yeah. that had a whole bunch of cards laying around. One was a Mickey Mantle. Submitted to PSA. Um, they don't know the story behind it. It's, I mean, it's pro- I think it, I didn't see the previous episodes, but I think it was sitting in somebody's garage for like 80 years. And then they submit it, it looks perfectly fine, off centered, and it comes back authentic, altered from PSA. So okay, wow. they, they tend to disagree. So his next episode, uh, because of like we just talked about, the difference in value between an SGC1 and authentic PSA altered. Um, is a big difference. So they decide to crack it open and they're going to about, they're about to resubmit it to SGC. And then I think the next episode is going to be, um, the result of that SGC submission. So it'd be interesting to watch. But, uh, seen cardboard, yeah. on a side note, the way that he cracks open the slabs is like, oh man, you guys have to watch it. It's very, uh, it's very hard <laughs> to watch because they do this, they do this method. <laughs> Where they take the, they yeah. take the crimper right into the middle of the top of the PSA slab, and yeah, what ends and up split it up. Yeah, what ends up happening? It just yeah. shatters right down the middle. Shatters, but you yeah, have a good yeah, chance yeah. of like, wow. when that happens, you have a good chance of like the card ripping or bending. Or, uh, it's like, oh man, you're about to do that to a fifty-two mantle. It's tough to watch. <laughs> <laughs> just crack the corner. Just crack the nip the corners, and then take a screwdriver. I don't know why they right, didn't do right. that, but yeah, you guys have to see okay. it if you get for those listening. Chasing cardboard. They do a pretty good job on their episodes. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look for sure. All right. Uh, yeah, we'll see how this plays out as usual with these things in the hobby. You know, um, you never know. You never know. But uh, I don't think uh, at any point in the near future, trimming vintage sports cards will be okay. So, so um, yeah, we'll see how this certainly plays out. All right. Uh, let's go on to our next segment. It's a new one. It's called Worth the Risk. And this is a segment where I'm going to list some modern cards that sold recently for big bucks. And you just tell me if you think it's, quote, worth the risk in buying at that said price. All right. Okay, so I got five or six. We'll see how we're doing on time. First one, 2023 Bowman Drew Jones Yellow Chrome, his first auto. The big chase of the 2023 Bowman Hobby Boxes. The yellow chrome is numbered to 75 and it's sold for 2500 No. No. <laughs> Definitely. No, not. for two reasons. <laughs> oh, man. No, for two reasons. Obviously, the hype. You know, we talked about this last week, last episode. Right. You know, I think Drew Jones, hey, he's going to be a pretty decent, you know, prospect and player, exciting player, plus defender. But mm-hmm. I'm just saying, it's just, you know, you got you got to perform now, and time is ticking. <laughs> so there's one, Bowman's yeah. a hype right now. So there's the bounty. So this is why it's inflating the price um, a lot. Mm-hmm. And two, it's it's a yellow. It's yeah. like you even talking about gold. <laughs> you talk about the fake gold, the yellow, right? So it's like <laughs> out of seventy five. And I know people like yellow. I'm not hating on yellow. It's a good parallel, but it's not for me, especially right. at twenty five hundred bucks. Yeah. You know, you you could extract extrapolate the data of previously bowman chrome yellows and you'll see that you know it's going to be a downward trend from here on out mm. so i'm i'm going to say no solid yeah. points uh ex- stole the words out of my mouth that's exactly what i'm <laughs> thinking too there's a definite no yep um let's go on to the next one because it's a definite <laughs> no for me as well I just that's start with the easy ones right yeah okay uh well you talked about gold it's this is a gold shimmer okay I've, the 2020 Bowman Chrome Gold Shimmer of Anthony Volpe, his Ooh. Prospect Auto. PSA 10. All right, this one's graded. The, the Drew Jones wasn't even graded. That was raw, 2,500. This Anthony Volpe Gold Shimmer, his first auto, PSA 10, sold for $3,742. Anthony Volpe. Uh, let me just see how How's he I haven't <laughs> checked up on Volpe. How is he doing? 221. He, he has a, almost a one war, so that means he's... He's doing something right, um, man. Mm-hmm. Thirty-seven hundred bucks for a PSA ten. 
Gold yeah. shimmer. Gold shimmer. I don't think it's a bad price. I don't think it's a bad price. Mm. Wait, that's an right? auto? Yeah. Gold shimmer. It's an auto. auto. Yeah. It's a gold gold shimmer auto. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, this is a harder one, huh? Hang on, let me just, uh, John. You could go ahead. Let me yeah, just think about. I'll make this it easy. For a I, can't, I can't. I'm gonna say no. I, I think Anthony Volpe. Uh, nothing to do with his skill level, but we talked about this before. This is like the Lamelo, you know, Anthony Edwards first year hype, um, all of that stuff. The Wander Franco last year, all of that sort of hype buzz. Who uh, J Rod, which is still, you know, a lot of the hype still exists for J Rod. Um, yeah. There's just too much hype around it, and I think. Um. Yeah, just not worth it. I, you know, you could make an argument that Anthony Volpe is worth it, and it is a gold, and et cetera, et cetera. Price may be gold not shimmer. too bad, but I, I'm still not. I'm not okay with. If we think Wander Franco is still overpriced, then how could we <laughs> say that Anthony Volpe is not right? So yeah, yeah. it's an easy no for me. Uh, for me, I'll. Uh, well, Young's still trying to ponder whether this is a good deal or not. Um, if it was a gold, a true gold, I might consider it. Right. The gold shimmer, yeah. it's a hobby logic thing. We talked about this in previous episodes. You know, like it's still number to 50, but, you know, gold shimmer versus true gold, I, I don't think it's equal. Um, hobby logic. So at the 3,700 price, and we talked about this before. Is he going to be the next Jeter? I don't think so. So that's another thing to consider. What Probably if he's he going to be though? a good player. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What if Drew Jones is the next uh, generational that's player? That's true. That's true. <laughs> Then his yellow will still go down because nobody wants yellow. <laughs> um, the, the fake gold, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm okay. Here, here's my here's my final answer. It's uh, <laughs> it's gonna be a no for me as well, just okay. because Anthony Volpe. Like I, I personally like Bobby Witt Jr. better than Anthony Volpe. I have always oh. liked it. Mm. Volpe has the hype with with being a New York Yankee right. yeah. and stuff like that. So I see there. I don't think it's a bad buy though. It, it could go either way. I think if Volpe sure. goes off to, it could go, you know, it'd be a good investment, right? So I remember when Volpe was worth nothing and then it was worth everything and then it's <laughs> worth nothing, not nothing, but like it's come down a lot from, yeah. from where it was, right? So, and again, Volpe was also part of that, you know, Jason Dominguez and Bobby Witt, you know, chase as well. So he was the probably number three out of that whole, that whole group right so mm-hmm. i'm gonna say no uh final answer all right <laughs> okay let's see uh about this one I, I feel like i know the answer to this but tops dynasty we always say that's very underrated 2022 20, tops dynasty i don't know if you saw the cards they look amazing amazing yeah right? mm-hmm. the the design looks amazing uh his rook like is it a rookie patch auto? I guess it isn't. But 2022 Topps Dynasty Wander Franco. Speaking of Wander Franco, his patch autograph one of one card sold for five thousand. Wow. Okay. Oh. I actually I'm gonna I'm I'll, I'll answer this because I've I actually been looking at Topps Dynasty a lot. Yeah. A lot of comps too. I've, I've because I'm I'm working out a deal potentially on a you know Tatis uh, oh. a dynasty as well, but. You you got to understand, Dynasty doesn't have a history of selling well, mm-hmm. um, especially for what it is. I think Topps Dynasty is one of the most underrated sets. I I, I personally love it, um, but it doesn't get love right now. But I think there's huge opportunity with Topps Dynasty in general. And what mm-hmm. was the price with the Franco five thousand for the one of one? I think that's that's oh man, uh, I think that's. Expensive, but because it's a one of one, I don't think it's a bad price. Because if Wander does end up, you know, doing well, I think there's a easy flip opportunity there. Because mm-hmm. previous previous prices of Otani and stuff like that, I think they're a lot more than you know uh, that. So that will give you a, a understanding of the type of potential it has. Because I think Otani, in terms of Topps Dynasty, would be the kind of like the staple of the potential. Right, sure. because uh, uh, it's relatively, you know, there's Topps Dynasty doesn't have a rich history of like any massive sales, right? And I know, um, like uh, patch autos aren't popular in baseball compared to you know basketball and football. So, but I think there's long term play in that for sure because I do believe uh, Topps Dynasty is such an underrated set in the hobby. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um. Before I get to my answer, 
and I'm I'm probably in the minority in this. I I'm not a fan of the 2022 design at all. Really? Yeah. You know, I'm a big fan of Refractor and Rainbow Foil, but Dynasty for some reason, like when I think of Dynasty and Flawless and National Treasures, I love the whiteboard, like the white background mm-hmm. where the patch and the auto kind of pop out of the card, right? Not like with the with it being like Rainbow Foilish. Yeah. It just looks too busy for me. It's it's not uh, it doesn't look clean anymore. So Fair. yeah, I'm I'm not a fan. But anyways, I'm probably in the minority when I say that, but let's get to to Wander Franco. Um I you know, like uh I, I just started listening to the uh the episode with Deep Value Investor that was on I forget I forget his name. I I my apologies. Brent. I Brent, yeah. I actually talked to him um on IG, so I should have known his name. My fault, Brent. Um but uh, he made some great points about you know like the the going after some of the top cards and one percent and stuff like that. And I think this is a perfect example. Mm-hmm. Like if you're gonna spend upwards of five thousand dollars on a Wander Franco and you feel like Wander Franco is starting to become a value buy or whatever, me personally, I, I'm gonna say no to the one of it is a one of one. And I, I'm you know me, I'm I'm very much on the on the train of like I think Dynasty is very undervalued, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But with that money, I would probably try and attempt to target what Brent was saying about like the top 100 cards or the top thousand cards right. of Wander Franco. Like for example, like going after a, I don't know how much they, if it is around the same price, but like a Bowman first BGS 95 blue ref, true blue refractor out of 150 auto for Wander Franco, like around five grand. Like me personally, I'll probably try to start to target something like that rather than uh, a one of one dynasty or a super factor of some other random random set that's pretty expensive etc cetera, etc cetera. so um that just that's me taking his advice i think i'm i'm more on his his opinion about this i think it makes a lot of sense to do something like that instead so i'm going to say no okay yeah um i'm going to say no to just the price it seems a bit too high but i understand because it is a one of one um maybe if it was a different player you know we talked about wander uh or, uh, at the top of the show and um you know i'm just looking over some comps it's hard to find comps right now because 2022 top dynasty didn't come out um uh too long ago mm. but like a 2021 tops dynasty of ronald acuna his one of one logo man patch auto sold for five thousand last year so that's if that's the comp then wander franco looks like it's probably a little overpriced and it probably will come down a bit um so i'm gonna say no but it's a nice looking card. I don't know what you're talking about, John. 2022, it's it's fire, man. Like, I, I think it's better than 2021. Oh, man, I don't actually, like it so. for some reason. <laughs> that don't look clean to me. Anyways. All right. Everyone has their opinion. Okay, a uh, couple more. Um, 2018, and I chose this one because it's not his regular card. Shohei Otani's 2018 Allen and Ginter framed auto. You know, it's like one of those, uh, it's like a mini, but it's framed. Mm. Um, BGS 9.5 10 sold for $4,625. Oh. So I've been, I've been looking at Otani autos for the longest time, <laughs> right, and right. they're so overpriced. And you need the good auto. So, for instance, like 2018, 2019 are the sure. good autos, right? Yeah. And obviously, you're, you're fighting for 2018, but you're going to pit pay a premium and i mm-hmm. i looked at that alan ginter that's out of 25 right you said um was, i don't know if it's out of 25 i think that but... one is out of 25 i don't think i i believe that one okay sold was out of 25 yeah. um i don't think it's a bad buy to be honest i think it's a little high for alan and ginter obviously but because shohei otani autos are so difficult to find i think long term um as long as Shohei's doing what he's doing I think any 2018 Shohei, Shohei Auto is is going to be a you know very scarce you know memorabilia and a a, a very big hobby chase um, yeah. you know in years to come because it's so scarce right so mm. I actually was looking at the Allen Ginter too it's a, it's an awesome card actually the auto is awesome nice. the card itself is awesome I don't mind it it's a little high like I said but for me someone who's shop been shopping for Otani autos and still can't pull the trigger because if you're if you're looking at any of his top cards you're gonna overpay regardless um, yeah. for that auto so uh, you probably want to wait and not buy right now 
So I think you you still are buying at a at a peak in four grand, especially for something like Allen and Ginter. But on the flip side, it is a 2018 Otani Auto, and it's very very difficult to find license in a respectable grade um, mm-hmm. uh, at a price. So I don't think it's a bad purchase. Yep, and just to confirm, you are right. It's numbered to twenty five, mm-hmm. and it's Allen and Ginter X. It has a silver marker auto. Right. right. Yeah. It's a nasty card. Do you guys know the story of why Shoei has so many different kinds of autos? Well, he just got lazy, I think, in 2020. But they look so uh, different, it's just right? Like, like the good one is well, the one that kind of looks like a that, upside down That's like Acuna. Right? Yeah. You look yeah. at Acuna's auto in 2017, Bowman. It's beautiful. It's a masterpiece. And then it's just like he stopped caring. And then same with Otani. <laughs> it's like it's like it looks nothing like it. Nothing. And that's why there's a demand yeah. for... The 2018, 2019, right? right? He's like, it's it's really nicely inscripted. And nicely, it looks in like an upside, right? upside down triangle. You know, his new yeah, one just looks just, kind of like a big giant C. I don't even know what that. What yeah, that like is. a C or a circle or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a fan. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm not liking either. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna kind of go back to like the Wander Franco thing here. Like, um, it's a little bit. It is. It is rookie auto. It is numbered. A uh, little bit more obscure. I think for me, I'd rather... I mean, I, I'm being a bit biased, but I personally am, am really getting onto the train of like real one autos, especially like the red. Mm-hmm. And um, I've seen... I keep my eyes on it. Not that I'm, I'm like a serious buyer, but I just like to keep tabs on it. And like a BGS9, BGS85, Red Ink Auto probably goes for around the same price, if not maybe a little bit less. Like right around that 5,000 mark. And mm-hmm. I would rather um, go for a lesser grade of a more well-known of his of his like a well-known auto of his one of his rookie cards. That's me personally. And maybe you can make the argument that real one auto isn't one of the more well-known. I don't know, but me personally, I would rather the ten grand though. <laughs> no, but like the the lower grade ones, I think go for around five grand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'd rather yeah, go yeah. lower grade and go for like like a red one, red ink auto. Right. Than something like this. Funny, funny enough, do you guys like? I know in the Korean heritage, old school, like you signing your name in red is considered very, very bad luck. I don't know what it is. You know, if somebody <laughs> <Yeah>. can <laughs> confirm if it, in Japanese if, if it's the same thing, but I know that it's really bad luck to sign your name in red. So I wonder how Show here any of these guys felt signing their name with red ink. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Like, how much are you yeah. paying me? Yeah. Yeah, maybe he doesn't care, but maybe his uh, his mom gave him a slap on the back of the head after you. <laughs> Are you talking about the um, the Topps Heritage real one where he's just kind of standing with the ball in his hand? I think, yeah. I think there, two, there's two images, right? He has two images, okay. yeah. He yeah. has two, two red inks. And two, I think the one where yeah, he's holding the bat is the more expensive one, is it? I, I, one of them, one of the two is more expensive than the other. Okay, I don't know. The one the where he's just holding the ball um, sold... March of 2023, so a couple months ago, for uh, BGS 9.5, and it's numbered to 69, right? The red ink. Yeah. So for just under 14,000. Whoa. <laughs> oh, that's a 9.5. So you're not. That's it's a 9, BGS 9.5. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, you won't be able to afford that with the $4,500 no, budget can't. that we're talking about. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I'm i kind of with Young. Like, I feel like with the. It's numbered. It's a Shohei 2018 auto. I agree with that point too. And the way Shohei's playing, the way he's kind of, you know, the longer he plays and the longer he does what he does, like, I think there's always going to be a market for his autograph cards, especially for 2018. And even if it's not one of the top brands or, you know what I mean? Like, even though if it's, even though it's an Allen and Ginter X, um, with a nice auto, with a nice eye appeal of a card, um, yeah, I, I don't think that that'll be a problem selling at a local show. Like, I think we've kind of saw that a little bit at the Sport Card Expo. You know what I mean? Right. Like, people are looking for Shohei, and they're like, I'll take whatever it's so nice tough. autograph I've, card. I've been looking. I've been yeah. looking. You can't right. pull the trigger because everything's too expensive. And then, you know, you kind of get FOMO, and then you're like, right. damn, I need I need a Shohei auto. <laughs> All right. I got a, right. I got a qu- question for you guys then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the card that you guys are just talking about the 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 Allen and Ginter first mm-hmm. with that same money would you rather and you we guys we saw it on the Bowman High Rollers group the guy selling the Onyx 
Otani Congiato for forty nine hundred. Which that of, was twenty twenty one though, right? Was it? But still, it's a Congiato, right? Those are how many yeah, of those a, are yeah, in existence, yeah. right? Would you yeah. rather that or this? It's right around the same price. I will say, I just seen a, the Congiato. I think I, I I might be wrong, but I think it sold recently on auction. The exquisite Congiato was like forty k. Uh, yeah, it was like I think fifty thousand. It may, yeah, might have gone 50, over fifty thousand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was the exquisite. So yeah. our boy Andrew, I submitted that, you know, that dented <laughs> exquisite auto. It looks amazing in looks that, sick. you know, yeah. uh, the authentic auto 10. But, uh, but yeah, that, that card sold for 40k or whatever is 50k mm-hmm. recently. So yeah, you 51, have 51,600. That's insane. That was PWCC. Yeah. PWCC wow. premier auction. By the way, I saw, a, I saw a Congiato on his, um, Bowman Chrome, and really? I, I don't know if it's superimposed, but I saw it on somebody's like uh, this the best one of these like best cards in the hobby um, photographs, and and it was there. It was like a Bowman Chrome. He was pitching, you know, the where he's like tipping over, and it was yeah, uh, yeah, it was yeah. like that's big time card. Then. Yeah, it was like one of ninety nine, or like one of the earlier ones, and I think he signed it a kanji. I don't know if it's real, but I saw it. Damn, interesting. Anyways, yeah. I don't know. For me, I, I don't know what I don't know anything about the Onyx company. Is that a, is that an Asian company? I have no idea. But I think I think I would rather the Kanji Auto. To be honest, it's just so desired and it's so rare that regardless of rook being rookie year, I thought that was a pretty good deal on the Bowman High Rollers. But it wasn't graded. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think it was in a S- SG or a CG CGC CGC slab, oh, like a okay, like okay. a nine or something like that. Oh yeah, we're yeah we're talking about how that's in the wrong slab. I would, right, right, right. I would right, buy right. that and crack immediately it, crack it out and go PSA. Crack it and submit it to PSA. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Damn, that's a hard one. Mm. That's a hard one. And I know no, you probably Clark, go for the. You, you've been looking. You've been wanting the kanji, right? That's like a grail, yeah. but I, I think it's just out of my price range at, at this point, right? So. Right. Um, I might just do it. I hate the Onyx look. I hate that as Onyx, yeah. <laughs> but it's a it's a kanji auto, yeah. So I might I might just do that. <laughs> yes, I got Clark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I got a couple more, but we'll save that for our next episode. Um, since we're since we're kind of doing a, a kind of a prelude to a pick one, let's just get right into it. Our weekly segment we call Pick One. All right, um, Young, do you want to start things off as we, um, as you normally do? Sure thing. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about Otani since we're already on here because his overpriced <laughs> okay. cards that everybody wants. Um, uh, I want to pair him up with uh, Mookie Betts because I feel like Mookie Betts is still somewhat undervalued in the hobby. Um, so an example is... Uh, his gold Bowman Chrome uh, first auto from 2014, it last sold for 10.95K. And by no means am I saying this is a deal or cheap. By no means. But it is a gold of Mookie Betts. And I remember these things. You couldn't even sell them for like three, four grand at one point. Um, it's a it's a surprisingly a Pot 41, which which is crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, a BGS 9.5, Pot 41, numbered out of 50. Uh that versus a Bowman 2018 Bowman Chrome um, Shohei Otani, the pitching Atomic Refractor BGS, uh, that sold for fourteen thousand um, dollars. So it's uh, basically the Mookie Betts Gold for eleven k as an investment, or the Shohei Atomic Bowman Chrome pitching auto. That sold for 14k, which is going to net you out the better investment at the end of the day. I can go first. Um, it's easy for me. I, think because, I, like, I, I know what's coming. Do you? I feel like I do because I'm I, in my head. I'm still going back and forth, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I want as a PC, as a pers- like as a collector. Like I want the Shohei, amazing right. card. But as an investment piece, I'm going with the gold Mookie. Like maybe, maybe it's after that interview with Brent, Deep Value Investor One. Um, just knowing that, you know, and and also I saw the uh, IG story by our hobby friend Scotty B Cards listing out the active players. Um, what was it? The active players and their war, mm. and and Mike Trout and Mookie Betts are the only one right now 
that are on pace to hit a, a ridiculous number. You right. know what I mean? Um, so, you know, we talked about this before too, right? Mookie doesn't get the respect he deserves or as much of the respect that he should probably get. And I think um, over time, it's it's going to change, especially with the war stat over time, if he if he continues to play the way he does. And if you have a gold Bowman Chrome, um, talking about one of his better cards, I would include it within the top 100, 250 uh, Mookie Betts cards. You know, I think that has a better chance of increasing in value. So as an investment, I'm going for the Mookie Gold Refractor. Yeah, I am... Uh... Is that what you thought I was going to say? Or? Yeah, that's exactly what I thought you were going to say. Because <laughs> um, we we know that out of the three of us, you're the Mookie guy. So I, I figured, okay, this I know what's coming. But mm. um, me personally, I am I have been on the hunt to get another Otani. I'm I'm obviously waiting. It's a bit too inflated right now. Uh, but let's say even this card. Let's say you know mid season lull. The atomic drops down to 10k, so they're they're equal value. Um, I'm not necessarily I don't have, own anything Mookie, and I don't really necessarily plan on own anything Mookie. But again, this is not my wheelhouse, ten thousand dollars. But somebody spending ten grand, if I were to sort of recommend uh, of the two, what you get um, outside of you know buy what you love. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm going to go with the Mookie too, and this is a a, a a bit of Brent's mm. uh, deep value investors, like I'm, I'm again, yeah. kind of take his advice to heart, attacking uh, some of the rarest cards of the best players in baseball. Um, you know, I think the regular fan and the regular, ba- you know, this is why Mookie cards don't move is people aren't looking at war and people are undervaluing him as as a uh, you know what's soon to be an all time legend and everything. Everybody's on Shohei, rightfully so. Sh- Rightfully so. Like Shohei might end sure. up being the best player of all time, you know. Um, but we're talking one of Mookie's, you know, could this guy could go down as top 10, top 15, top 20 baseball player of all time. And one of his best and rarest cards is available for 10000 I think this is the type of card that with your money at 10000 you could be pretty confident that it's that this is the floor. Like it's just going to continue to go up and up and up and up and you know there are big time heavy investors that are hard hardcore baseball guys right that would like absolutely love this kind of card right so i think um yeah. if you're in the in that boat to spend ten thousand dollars between these two cards yeah for me it's also the mookie all right nice. two for i think mookie. i think i think long term you know mookie definitely is the right call Mm -hmm. but i think if you're looking for a short-term opportunity i think otani actually might be uh not a bad candidate uh 14k is a little uh steep for me if they're 10k 10k i probably you know pick the otani Mm. but i think like for me my strategy is long-term rare but the pot 41 does concern me a bit with the mookie but that just shows you how strong you know um bowman chrome was with bgs you know, back in, you know, the mid 2010s right. to 2018, right? It was, it was dominated. Nobody would submit prospect cards to PSA. It's right. very, very rare. Is and it number to the 50? The whole thing changed, still, right? It is number to 50, but okay. it's a pot 41, yeah. which is, which is insanity, right? Um, and that's something to just to note. Um, but I think, uh, Otani might have the volatility that, you know, someone who's looking more of a short term, short term play, uh, of the way Otani's playing, but yeah, like for me, I'm I'm a collector first, so I'm gonna go with the Mookie as well. I just I just something with golds is does it for me, you know. And I think Otani, it's the right Otani card. I'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's 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 definitely overpriced. So I'm gonna go Mookie. Mookie sweep. All right. Cool, John. All right, boys. Uh, I got a basketball one for you guys. Um, Two two nemesis. One year later, oh how the story has changed. We're gonna go twenty seventeen. Luca, uh, is it twenty seventeen? What's his rookie card? Uh, twenty eighteen. Sorry, twenty eighteen prism. Clark, yeah. you know this one very well. His uh, PSA mm-hmm. ten silver. It has been dropping like a rock. Uh, last sold eleven fifty USD versus yeah. 
His arch nemesis, Devin Booker. PSA 10, silver, <laughs> last sold for 1200 So right around the same price. One guy was viewed as the big-time villain. You know, he's not that dude. People were not on him at all, and Luka was the man. One year later, Luka's out of the, the playoffs, and people are cl- clearly tons of people are bailing, bailing on him, saying he's overpriced. Mm-hmm. And then you got Booker that might win a championship. Maybe not. They're down 2, two nothing, But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, what do you guys think? Yeah. Oh man, uh, I hate to say this, but I'm gonna go with Booker. I just think the pop count is just too much of a factor to ignore. I think it's as simple as right. that. And to listeners, the and, the, the uh, Luca pop count is 2200, and the the Booker is just above Booker. just above 200. Exactly, huge difference. Yeah. Um, obviously, I like Luca better as a player, and you know, just in terms of collecting. Basketball cards, Luca is the one I'm targeting all the time. Um, but if we're comparing these two, they're both silver prisms. Um, I think the shines kind of come off since the hype, right? right? Um, and you got to go, you can't, you can't ignore the pop count in this case. So I'm going with Devin Booker. You know, that pop count always concerned me with Luca. I, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, won't retain value, especially if there's a max, mass exodus you know, on Luca, and, mm-hmm. you know, if, if, if the pop count wasn't so high, I think the prices would be protected a lot more, but I think you're seeing market correction happening, you know, pop 200 versus 2000 is the kicker, mm-hmm. right? And for me, you know, 2015 silver prisms were super rare, you know, because, you know, back in the, you know, early, you know, 2012s to, you know, 2017, basically, silvers are real silvers. They were the actual hits, and then you have your golds, right? So it's not like you have a million parallels uh, like you do nowadays. And, you know, yeah, you just have way too many options, right? And we were we were telling we were talking about this you know luca's prices were not sustainable with those pop counts it was a mass production card even in the silvers and it's not the same silver as uh the old school prisms so i'm gonna go devin booker just based on pop count um and you know i don't think it's a bad play to pick up luca when it does hit you know bottom because i think 2000 pop um is still reasonable for any relevant card right so i think there's going to be a buying opportunity with luca i just think at 1200 bucks a pop if i'm gonna spend 1200 bucks i'm gonna pick the uh, booker silver prism in a heartbeat yeah you guys know how i feel about luca i I still want in um and i'm actually glad that numbered though yeah i'm glad that people are bailing because i can't wait to try and get a more rare prism or something um Mm -hmm. but with that being said uh, I think everybody has been witnessing what's been happening in the market. And, you know, base has been on a pretty large free fall. And what was once known as flagship or quote unquote, their main rookie, um, almost no longer exists anymore. I think base is almost all but dead. Like, I think if you own a base, you should probably bail on it. And um, sadly, I think that's also now spilling into silvers and optic hollows and refractors and stuff like that because they're just not numbered. There's a lot of them available. And what used to be the gold, you know, quote unquote gold standard prism silver, I think that's going to start to go away. I, I honestly, it's looking like the trend is kind of going that way, which is sad because I mean, this is the silver PSA 10 Luca was kind of on its way to becoming kind of iconic. Um, so I don't want to pick the Booker, but with, for twelve hundred bucks, you know you're you're protecting your money. You know, as much as I am a Luca fan, it would be a great PC. Nobody likes to see their PC card go from two thousand to one thousand down to seven fifty or whatever it's going to drop to. Um, so for twelve hundred bucks to save your money, I think you have to go with the Devin Booker at two hundred pop. You're gonna yeah, you're gonna protect your money. So at the very minimum, yeah, it's gonna be the Booker. Sadly. Yep. Yep. Sorry, Clark. Another sweep. I know. Yeah. Anyone want my silver prism? Dude, I'm, I'm or... sitting on a bunch of Luca, <laughs> Luca base PSA 10s, and it's like, Bruh. wah, wah. We got to get, we got to um, unload and then reinvest yeah. quickly. Yeah. All right. That's a good one. Okay. We'll end off uh, this show with my 
pick one. So this is for, I know a lot of people say, not a lot, but some people do say that we always focus on the super high end. But uh, so I chose one that's both under 500 bucks. All right. Um, and it's back to baseball. On one side, I got 2020 Bowman Chrome, Jeremy Pena. His uh, rookie auto PSA 10 sold for 355 recently. All right. Uh, base auto. And the 2018, who this guy's having a resurgence this yep. year. And I was on him. If you remember, I was on him two, two and a half years ago. And then I bailed on him last year. <laughs> and now, of course, as soon as I bail on him, he is having the career year, the banner yeah. year. So 2018, Jared Kelnick, his first Bowman Chrome draft auto. Also PSA 10 sold for 305 bucks. So they're both within the 300, mm. 350 range. Mm. Which, which one are you going for? So first off, you know, I was the camp that said I'm off of Kellenic. And mm-hmm. I, I, I still am not on Kellenic. Just just to put it out there, he is still young. So that's what he has going for him. Yeah. So currently he's tearing it up, right? Yeah. He's hitting 309, seven bombs. He has a 1.3 war this year. Mm-hmm. Okay, just, just throwing this out. With the <laughs> 1.3 war... His career war now is negative zero point seven. Okay, <laughs> just just throwing it out there. So it was at one point a negative two war in two seasons. Right. Okay, so that's something to kind of like you know okay. think yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. think that, think out there. But he is still young, whereas Jeremy Pena is a little older, and Jer- Jeremy Pena isn't having a great season. I'd say he's right. a lot of hype was based around him. He's 25, 26 years old. So it's a lot older. He has a six war. So I think Kellenic definitely has more time to kind of like pick it up. Uh, even though Kellenic prices are insane compared to where they were, there's already a massive growth in Jared Kellenic right now because of the way he's playing this year. But yeah. for me, if I'm going to pick between the two, I'm probably going to go Kellenic in this, in, in this case, just because, you know, Pena concerns me if he hits, you know, 250, 260 with, you know, 20 bombs. What's his prices look like, right? So uh, for me, Kalanick still has he's he's raking right now and he's having a good season. So I think he could, you know, you know, he there's some more room to grow if he continues it. But that's something to note. He he is he is killing it in war, but he still has a negative career war. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, I so you guys of the three of us, I'm probably the least knowledgeable on prospects and you know all of that stuff so i'm going to be speaking from a very casual point of view for for Mm -hmm. listeners that are kind of more on my end um without knowing that much about either player obviously we know that kellenic had a lot of buzz two years ago and jeremy Pena's time to have buzz was last year um so even from a market standpoint i would say that kellenic kellenic is right now buzzing like the price i'm assuming the prices have gone up and whereas Peñas has simmered and probably gone down. So you would think, you know, it would make sense that maybe Peña has, is the better value. But I'm going to come from the perspective of kind of what uh, Hyung touched about. Without knowing too much about either player, but knowing some information, I think I would personally rather go for somebody that... Because, again, you kind of have to... Like Brent was mentioning, like th- there is... When you study like human psychology, there's a lot of that in sports cards as well right so if, if it, it's a a, a right. fourth round pick that all of a sudden starts buzzing it takes a lot for people to continually believe that this person is going to become the next mike trout as a fourth round pick or a seventh round pick or a 12th round pick right kind of like fred van vliet like a journeyman that turned into an mm-hmm. all-star still will i don't think he in his life will get the respect even if he ends up being like a 12 time all-star because of his pedigree right whereas somebody what that was a first pick overall that kind of fell off that never really had his chance and then starts to develop and starts to kill it. I think the buzz and the pricing and all of that, the the human psychology, people will easily jump on that and easily be confident that, the, yes, he's arrived. Like this is the guy that we've been talking about, right? So with all that being said, you know, Ka- uh, Kalanick, younger, first round pick, he's got the pedigree, all of that stuff, brutal first two years like absolutely yeah. horrendous <laughs> right um which completely tanked anything that had to do with his value but now some people you know like seeing it this is what we're talking about this was the 
this is what people saw him as like the first round pick. So I think um, without knowing too much of the two, just the fact that he's younger and he's a former first round pick that has that pedigree, I think he has a chance for if you're spending 300 bucks, you're going to throw some money at a, at a low value pick. Uh, between two cards, he's the one that has a chance to 2x, 3x, and, and for this card to become a $700 card or $900 or $1,100 card, I think um, the the volatility is, is, is more there, so I'd rather go with uh, Jared Kalanick. All right. It looks like for this week's pick one, it's a sweep all around. I'm going with Jared Kalanick. Um, I don't think I have to say anything further because you you pretty much covered all the bases between the two of you um i was just looking at mike trout's war in his first season 2011 when he came in and you know it wasn't he was below average when he came into the league it wasn't as bad as kelnick it was 0.7 right so you know sometimes players that young and and mike trout was 19 too at the time when he came in the first season so mike trout was super young but kelnick was still young he was 21 22 21 right? yeah yeah so um you know uh, there's adjustment taking place, and now he has 1.3 already. Uh, you know who who's to say he can't? This is a season where he starts to have really great positive WAR and just really contributes to the team. So I think he has the most potential to do that over Jeremy Pena, who I feel like is still riding that playoff high prices. You know what I mean? He was the yeah. he was the MVP. He was doing really well, and we're kind of seeing that correction. So he's going the other way. I think Jared Kellnick's going the positive way. So that's why I'm choosing Kellnick. Um, yeah, and and you know Trout uh, in 2012, the second year after his poor season, he had he only had a 10.2 WAR in his second year when he was 20. So uh, I'm not saying he's going to be the next Trout, but you know uh, Kelnick, I- I'm hoping that by the end of the season he'll be back in the positives um, in terms of WAR, and then yeah, he's off to the races. All right, um, good show. Uh, we had a lot to talk about on different subjects. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, as always, just like uh, Mailman Matt, we always appreciate you guys giving us five stars and a nice review wherever you listen to your podcast. And uh, we'll have a brand new episode uh, for you uh, next week. Talk to you then. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to Cards to the Moon. We'd really appreciate you subscribing to our podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. And you can also connect with each of us on Instagram at Five Card Guys. Or you can follow Hyung at Integrity Sports Cards or John at Trade You at Recess. You can also check us out at fivecardguys.com. Thanks again and hope to connect soon.